ජීවිතේ වැඩිපුර ලැබෙන හොඳම දේවල් දෙන්න දැන් SLT Broadband වෙති 75% දක්වා වැඩිපුර ඩේටා සතුට ජනවාරි 15 වෙනිදා සිට ශ්‍රී ලංකා ටෙලිකොම් Drastic measures President Maithripala Sirisena declares a 7 day state of emergency following recent violence in Kandy Symptoms of the illness Parliament debates what could have been done to quell the violence in Digana. Honorable Prime Minister, you want to say anything? Government has take, is taking all possible measures. If what had to be done was done at the right time, this country would not have come to this situation. Respectfully ask the President and the Prime Minister to enforce law and order to the full. A mine-free nation. Special envoy on the mine ban convention. assesses the country's progress. Everyone should be very proud of and we have to finish the demining by 2020. The good and the bad. Contradictory views expressed over the Office of Missing Persons Bill. Hindering aid efforts. A humanitarian aid convoy fails to unload supplies to trapped residents in Syria's eastern Ghouta. 70 people killed. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhamik Ekanayake. We start today with President Maltri Palasirisena's promulgation of a state of emergency to restore the tense security situation that arose following clashes in certain parts of the country. The President's Media Division said police and armed forces are suitably empowered to deal with criminal elements in the society and to urgently restore normalcy. State of emergency was imposed in accordance with the public security ordinance where the president declared a state of limited emergency for a period of 1 week. Five aspects have been taken into consideration for the imposition of state of emergency in the country. Accordingly, violent and criminal acts that prevailed over the last 2 weeks, resulting loss of lives and property damage, religious and ethnic conflict brought on by the incidents. vandalism of property places of worship and transportation facilities continuations of the above mentioned criminal acts e sidwim tula i express my deepest condolences and regret to families who lost their loved ones because of these violent incidents and those who had to endure property damage i also strongly condemn these acts of violence i have instructed the police to take severe legal actions against individuals organizations and groups who are responsible for these incidents we have also instructed the police police special task force and army to maintain peace in these areas 24/7 over the next few days as well i took these measures following a national security meeting that was held to discuss these incidents i had these discussions with the prime minister and the cabinet of ministers and we decided on further actions to take in the future there are attempts to agitate the public by spreading false rumors We will take strict legal actions against them. I would also like to emphasize that I will do everything to maintain peace in the country. A police spokesperson, S.P. Ruan Gunasekar, has said to other Derna that the Kandy administrative district will be under police curfew from 8 this evening until 6 in the morning tomorrow. Earlier in the day, the police issued notices to continue the police curfew until further notice. Let's now take a look at the latest developments of the Teldeni incident. Violence ensued in the area of Teldeni in Digana over the past two days, centering the death of an individual following an assault. H.D. Kumar Singh, who succumbed to his injuries at the Kandy Hospital on Saturday following an assault, was a father of two and worked as a truck driver in Teldeni. On the 22nd of February at 2 in the morning when he drove to a fuel station in Teldeni a three-wheeler driver had attempted to take over his truck several times but Kumar Singh allegedly had not let him through this provoked the people traveling in the three-wheeler to assault Kumar Singh Kumar Singh was transferred to the ICU of the Kandy Teaching Hospital in critical condition where he succumbed to severe head injuries on Saturday at around 5 in the morning Clashes erupted at several locations in Teldeni and Digana since Sunday. A police curfew was imposed within the Kandy administrative district from last afternoon to 6 a.m. today following the tense situation. Despite the police curfew in place, an unidentified group of people vandalized and burnt a fuel station as well as several stores in Katugastota and Aladeni last night. This prompted police to impose a curfew on the Kandy administrative district from 8 p.m. today until 6 a.m. tomorrow. 24 suspects arrested yesterday for violent behavior was further remanded today until the 19th by the Teldeni Magistrate Court. Meanwhile, following violence, a body was discovered from a house in the area of Inkangala in Digana today. 
The deceased is identified as 27-year-old Abdul Basis, whose funeral was held today. Meanwhile, a special security program was implemented in the troubled areas with the combined efforts of the police, police special task force and army. In addition, police media spokesperson S.P. Rwan Gunasekara said that the IGP dispatched a group of CID officials to Digana today to investigate the recent manifestations. The Education Ministry even took measures to close all schools in the Kandy Administrative District today as well as tomorrow. Meanwhile, several religious representatives from Kandy expressed their views on the matter today. All citizens must understand that these incidents are prompted by certain organizations. They influence the youth while burning mosques. It's very unfortunate. We ask all citizens to act in a manner to protect peace and reconciliation. We can't say only one religious group did this. All religious entities must be humble enough to accept responsibility here. We ask all security forces to take legal action against all wrongdoers. Meanwhile, a Hatal campaign was held in Kattankudi, Akarepattu, Murutamune, where all stores and institutes were closed in protest of the incident. The other than a reporter, Marutamune, said 17 individuals were arrested by the police following violent behaviour. Meanwhile, it has been decided during the meeting of the cabinet ministers headed by President Maitri Pala Sirisena to impose a week-long state of emergency. We express our utmost displeasure in the way the police handled all situations from the Ampara situation to the situation in Teldenia. We kept on asking the police to provide security in the Degan area. This wouldn't have happened if they had done that before. It was discussed in the cabinet meeting to take action against all those senior police officers who are responsible. The trust in the government, in the security as well as the police has now been broken. What happened was four useless drunkards killed an innocent individual. I ask all citizens not to drag nationalism into this. In the meantime, several parties voiced their views on the prevailing situation across the country. The last couple of days, we have had some incidents in a couple of cities in our country which we completely look down on. Despicable acts of harming people and also destroying property. And this is completely looked down on and it's completely basically out of bounds and unacceptable. Those who cannot resolve issues in a civilized society, in a civilized manner, generally turn to these kinds of ways in resolving their issues. Is Digana the only area in the country where a vehicle is not allowed to be overtaken by another? Even after tooting the horn several times, not allowing a vehicle to overtake has caused this issue. Anger has taken a life of a person. The anger arisen from the death resulted in burning shops and attacking another. Is it correct to respond to a wrongdoing with a similar action? Such tragic incidents would not happen if our country's rules are strong enough and if the people respect the rule of law. These things don't just happen. In my view, this is a planned effort towards dictatorship. Police has a duty to carry out thorough investigations into the incident and look for those who are behind it. We have to prevent the country's image being tarnished before the international community. When these things happen, the international community could say Sri Lanka is not stable and then they intervene. Sometimes it can be a military involvement from a powerful country. People neglect the law when they feel that one section of the society is treated differently. If the government takes prompt action independently, such pathetic incidents will never happen. Prime Minister and the police are fully responsible for all the incidents which took place yesterday and today. Violence is taking place in Kandy. This should not continue. This is the same feeling we get when someone of our own dies. There is no difference in being Sinhala or Muslim. All are human beings. Therefore, we kindly request everyone to stop. The violent incidents that ensued in and around Kandy was also taken up in Parliament today. It is, I think, sir, the duty of the state to ensure that the system of governance in this country is altered in such a way as to ensure that all the people of this country feel equal. We have brought this situation upon ourselves by not doing what we needed to do at the right time. If what had to be done was done at the right time, this country would not have come to this situation. Other countries are moving forward. We are moving backwards. That is what is happening in this country. This situation must change. And I think, sir, one of the primary changes that we need is that there must be a change in the structure of governance. Structure of governance 
in this country being altered in such a way that you serve the needs of the people in the way the people desire, not really by conferring positions or power on a few individuals. My contention is that every party, sometimes for cheap political mileage, seems to encourage certain extreme elements. It is time for us to now put a full stop to uh, all these unruly elements for whom we give patronage by default, by not taking decisive action. That is what is lacking today. Then also decisive action for law enforcement. Now this mindset has to change. Honorable Prime Minister, you want to say anything? Government has take, is taking all possible measures to protect the people, especially yeah. the Muslims. We are also inquiring into, as you know, where there has been lapses. Speaking in Parliament, Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe has said that arrangements would be made to provide compensation to those who were affected by the violence and that Cabinet had decided to impose a state of emergency and other laws for a period of seven days if needed. We can observe that there are certain factions who are politically greedy, laying out agendas to disrupt the lives of the people. Their main objective was to spread extremism and destroy society in order to obtain support. There were various messages on social media within the past nine months, which showed an alleged group of Muslims levelling threats at the Sinhalese. The government will not hesitate to take legal action against individuals who encourage this. In this instance, the police enforced the rule of law. There were mishaps. There were certain areas that the law was not enforced. The IGP is currently holding investigations and if there are police officers who did not take action, then we will take measures against them. I would like to mention one thing. Most of the police officers took great efforts to ensure peace and law and order in the area. Respectfully, ask the President and the Prime Minister to enforce law and order to the full, either it is being a Muslim, single or Tamil. Ask for nothing more, nothing less, that law should be enforced equally before all. No religious leader, no individual, no politician should be able to take law into their own hands and carry out acts of arson. Now moving on to other local stories, special envoy on the anti-personnel mine ban convention to Sri Lanka, Prince Miradrad Zaid Al Hussein today praised Sri Lanka's efforts taken in the clearance of landmines in Jaffna. Meanwhile, Minister of Rehabilitation and Resettlement DM Swaminathan said that the government hopes to finish demining activities by 2020. Their remarks were made during an inspection of a mine clearance site in Jaffna. Special Envoy on the Anti-Personnel Mine Ban Convention to Sri Lanka, Prince Mirad Rad Zaid Al Hussein, who is on a four-day official visit to Sri Lanka, engaged in a field visit to a mine clearance site in Momali Jaffna today. He was accompanied by the Minister of Rehabilitation and Resettlement, DM Swaminathan, to observe demining programs carried out by the Sri Lanka Army Humanitarian Demining Unit and other demining agencies. I'm really very, very impressed with what I have seen. Uh, the professionalism is, is outstanding. The discipline is amazing. Everyone should be very proud of the work that is going on here in, in this area. Of course, it's difficult work. It's uh, time-consuming. It's uh, labor-intensive. Labor it's, it's costly also. But it's uh, very, very important for the lives of the people who live in this, this area. And hopefully uh, this good work will lead to more prosperity, hope in the region and, and uh, development in, in the region. And we have to finish the demining by 2020. And for, for, uh, to strengthen the, the bonds of peace in this area. We have requested him for great assistance for future demining. And His Royal Highness has agreed that he will give his fullest support and cooperation in respect of further demining in Sri Lanka and we have to finish the demining by 2020 and we can't get any further extensions on demining. Now the Patriotic Professionals Forum state that they hope to challenge the process adopted by the United Nations Human Rights Commission on Sri Lanka during the upcoming session on the 21st of this month. Now they expressed these views during a media briefing in Colombo today. What our foreign minister signed in Geneva in 2015, International Convention for Enforced Disappearance. He went and signed that and came back and ratified it. There are only very few countries in the world who have signed and ratified this. America has not signed this, Russia has not signed this, China has not signed this, okay. India has signed this but not, it has not ratified. So Sri Lanka not only signed but ratified. The second step is they came and passed an act in Sri Lankan parliament that is the Missing Persons Office, OMP. By passing this bill, basically there is an opportunity for the, this office or the people who are involved to collect information to uh, prosecute any armed forces people in the future. They can enter any army camp, they can collect any document, they can prosecute anybody who is not giving information. So, so much powers are 
given to, for these commissioners. We as citizens have to go and talk at the Human Rights Council and say that we don't agree to that. We have to say it is injustice. We don't accept that. Centre for Policy Alternatives, however, convening a media briefing, welcomed the appointments of the Office of Missing Persons. We want to press on record that we, of course, welcome the eventual appointment of the members of the Office on missing persons. It has taken some time to happen. This is the first of the four mechanisms that were promised by the government of Sri Lanka in respect of transitional justice and which were incorporated into Resolution 30 Stroke 1 at the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Disappearance have been a horrendous, horrible, nasty atrocity and unfortunately our country has one of the largest numbers of disappearances on record. We would also like to say to the government, there are three more that are pending. And when you presented this package, as it were, in Geneva, and what therefore are we waiting for? Do we have to wait one and a half years for each of these mechanisms to be set up? And if you do the arithmetic, by that time, there were may well be another government. Reconciliation is absolutely fundamental to the future of this country. There is unfinished business from the past, which we have to conclude. Parliamentarian of the UPFA, Bandula Gunwardana, charges that the government is letting foreign nationals do retail business in the country since large-scale investors in their right minds will not explore investment opportunities in Sri Lanka. MP Gunwardana made the remark at a media briefing today, sitting alongside the leader of the Sri Lanka, Podhijana Perumuna, Professor G.L. Pieris. If the policymakers of the government think that they can save fallen industries by just providing a low interest loan, they are mistaken. If the president genuinely wants to save local businessmen, the first step should be to suspend the signing of the ATCO agreement. Not only they are ruining businesses of locals, but they are allowing foreign nationals to do retail business here, since large-scale investors in their right mind would never come and invest in the country. Prime Minister's recent visit to Singapore to organize an investment forum is a joke. And I think he himself realized it. At the end of his speech, he said that if there is no one to come and invest, then at least come on holiday. The central bank governor said recently that there are concerns of Sri Lanka not being able to pay back foreign loans in the near future. Now, in other local stories, 12 trade unions of the Colombo Municipal Council has requested the governor of the Western Province to revert the decision to remove the commissioner of the Colombo Municipal Council from the post. The staff of the Colombo Municipal Council organized a protest march against the lack of a proper solution for the issue. The staff of the Colombo Municipal Council engaged in a protest march for the second day today against removing the commission of the Colombo Municipal Council, VK Anura, by the governor of the Western Province, KC Logeshwaran. The governor took the decision of removing the commissioner, stating that the secretary to the president informed him of holding an inquiry with regard to the collapse of the Mithotamulla garbage dump. However, the appointment of the new commissioner to the Colombo Municipal Council was cancelled and the deputy commissioner is appointed for the position of acting commissioner. However, since the order of transfer given to VK Anra was not reverted, the staff of the Colombo Municipal Council engaged in the protest march today as well. Members of the public continue to pay their last respects to the late chief incumbent of the Sri Sambodhi Temple in Colombo, Venerable Dharna Agama Kusala Dhammatera. The terrorist remains are currently resting at the Sri Sambodhi Temple. The remains of the late chief incumbent of the Sri Sambodhi Temple in Colombo and the founder of the channel, the Buddhist, late Venerable Dharna Agama Kusala Dhammatera, is currently placed at the Sri Sambodhi Temple. President Maitri Palasirisena was among those who paid their last respects to the late Venerable Thera. Remains of the late Venerable Kusaladamma Thera will be placed at the Sri Sambodhi Temple until Thursday, the 8th of March, with the cremation ceremony set for the same day at the Independence Square with state patronage. You are watching Sri Lanka's award winning news channel, Other Verena 24 7. Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, the Chief Minister of the Northern Province, C.V. Vigneshwaran, says that proper policy and regulation is required when promoting private sector development in the Northern Province. The Chief Minister expressed his concerns at an event held in Jaffna recently. 
The certificate awarding ceremony of the hospitality apprenticeship program in Jaffna was held under the patronage of Minister of Tourism Development and Christian Religious Affairs, John Amratunga, and the Chief Minister of the Northern Province, C. V. Vigneshwaran. The event was organized by the Sri Lanka Institute of Tourism and Hotel Management together with the Ministry of Tourism Development and Christian Religious Affairs. The steps taken for tourism development must be in consonance with our indigenous ethos, culture and aspirations. When it comes to the northern province or even the eastern province, the differences in our culture, language, religions and our ways of life must be taken into consideration. Every development project undertaken by the central government in our province must be with the consent and concurrence of the provincial administration. Policy and regulation must be in our hands while we promote private sector development. We do not want the centre to impose their preferred understanding of tourism on our students without first seeking to comprehend our views and aspirations. We have a number of diaspora tourism experts willing to come and serve us and advise to us to help and progress along our indigenous and traditional paths. We are not interested in duplicating Hikka dwellers in our province. So we should be able to bring in some regulation, not just allow them to run these institutions, which might give a bad name at the end of the day. We have to preserve the dignity of the country definition, because this is one area you could give a lot of help to your people. Our government is concerned to all the communities in this country. We have been funding many projects in the Eastern province. The chief minister there was also very active and he is acting quite a lot of our resources for his own development. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer was optimistic for successful completion of NAFTA talks and it and stressed on United Nations or United States rather preference for a tripartite agreement. Speaking to reporters in Mexico, he added that should the agreement fail, the U.S. is prepared to move on a bilateral basis. U.S. President Donald Trump, however, poured cold water on it, saying that the United States is unable to come to a common consensus. He is prepared to terminate the deal altogether. He was speaking to reporters during an Oval Office meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu yesterday. Everyone, are you going to back down on the tariffs? Jonathan no, we're not backing down. We've had a very bad deal with Mexico, a very bad deal with Canada. It's called NAFTA. We are renegotiating NAFTA, as I said I would. And if we don't make a deal, I'll terminate NAFTA. People have to understand our country on trade has been ripped off by virtually every country in the world, whether it's friend or enemy. Everybody. China, Russia, and think people that we think are wonderful, the European Union. We lost, over the last number of years, $800 billion a year. Not going to happen. we got to get it back. Thank you. I don't think you have a trade. Meanwhile, in Mexico, officials pushed to speed up NAFTA negotiations with the United States floating the idea of reaching an agreement in principle in coming weeks. Canadian Foreign Minister Christia Freeland said that it is wrong to see trade with Canada as a threat to the national security of the United States and calls the trade tariffs on Canadian steel and aluminium unacceptable. Meanwhile, Economic Minister of Mexico, Ildefonso Guajardo, added that Mexico should be excluded from the tariffs because of North America's position as the world's most integrated steel industry. He added that Mexico buys more steel than what it sells to the United States. Now, Sri Lankan shares dropped to their lowest close in nearly three weeks today. The Columbus Stock Index ended 0.3% weaker at 6,533.46, following a 0.28% drop last week. Turnover was 436.8 million rupees, less than half of this year's daily average of 954.9 million rupees. Now, let's take a quick look at how the Sri Lankan rupee fared today.
Now let's take a look at news from around the globe. A humanitarian aid convoy has failed to unload some supplies to residents trapped inside Syria's eastern Ghouta as government warplanes resumed bombarding the enclave, killing at least 70 people. Described as the bloodliest day since a Russian-sponsored truce failed at stopping the onslaught, Syrian government forces resumed the shelling of the Damascus suburb for the 16th consecutive day today. The Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said the bombardment of the Eastern Ghouta enclave has killed more than 70 civilians since last evening. Residents of Eastern Ghouta, which lies to the east of Damascus, have previously voiced their skepticism of a Russian proposed five hour daily humanitarian pause that began last Tuesday. The resumption of the aerial campaign yesterday came shortly after 46 trucks sent by aid agencies managed to pass through a government controlled checkpoint for the first time in nearly a month. But aid workers said that the Syrian army confiscated many of the supplies on board. As a result, nine trucks were prevented from unloading its contents, which were largely medical supplies. North Korea's KCNA news agency says that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un had a meeting with South Korean special envoys yesterday in Pyongyang and heard the intentions of South Korean President Moon Jae-in for a summit and made a satisfactory agreement. KCNA, however, said that Kim gave the important instructions to the relevant field to rapidly take practical steps for it, but the news agency did not provide details on what the agreement was. A 10-member South Korean delegation led by National Security Office head Chang Yu yong went to North Korea yesterday in hopes of encouraging North Korea and the United States to talk to one another. The two sides have stoked months of tension in the region, prompted by bellicose insults between U.S. President Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. Seoul's delegation met Kim Jong-un, his sister Kim Yo-jong, Kim Jong-un's wife and other officials yesterday. The delegation wrapped up a two-day trip to Pyongyang today after another meeting with North Korean officials. Now let's take a look at some other stories emerging from across the globe. The leaders of two anti-establishment parties have each claimed they had the right to govern Italy after voters in Europe's fourth largest economy did not return a majority to any single party. The Eurosceptic populist Five Star Movement was the biggest single party with a third of the vote. Former Prime Minister Matteo Renzi has resigned as leader of the governing centre-left Democratic Party which performed poorly, taking less than 20% of the vote. Strong aftershocks rocked the remote highlands in Papua New Guinea, increasing the death toll to 55 yesterday from a 7.5 magnitude earthquake a week ago, with it expected to rise further. The International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies shared pictures of damages in the aftermath while making their way towards the epicenter of the quake. Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman met Coptic Pope Tawadros II at Cairo's largest Coptic cathedral yesterday in what state media said was an unprecedented visit by an official from the conservative Muslim kingdom. He will head for Britain and the United States later this month. The doors to the Geneva car show opened today, but the auto industry meets under the shadow of German diesel bans and US steel tariffs. Car makers may be forced to slam on the brakes when it comes to production of larger models or one with bigger engines, as diesel's decline puts them on a collision course with EU carbon emissions goals. And there's also Trump's threat of a tax on car imports if the EU retaliates against his plan to slap tariffs on aluminium and steel. You are watching Sri Lanka's award-winning news channel, Other Verena 24-7. Time for sports and it is, of course, cricket. Sri Lanka won the toss and chose to bowl first in the first match of the Nidahas Trophy 2018 between India and Sri Lanka. Although India lost two quick wickets at the start, Shikhar Dhawan's 90 off just 49 deliveries gave Sri Lanka a formidable target of 175 runs. Sri Lanka has lost the two wickets of Kusal Mendes for 11 and Danushka Gunatilaka for 19. They were on 98 for two wickets a short while ago. In fact, we just lost a wicket that makes it Sri Lanka 98 for the loss of three wickets. Oh, this has gone over mid on. Has it gone all the way? Yes, yes. Not quite the power. And goes straight to that field. And where has that gone? Straight down the man's throat at fine leg. So Sri Lanka strikes. Sort of where they could have been. Looking at the 1670. 
Now, the Moratua grounds will host the Battle of the Goals this weekend between the Prince of Wales College and St Sebastian's College. It will be the 68th time the two sides go head to head. In the latest lineup of big matches, two colleges from Moratua, the Prince of Wales and St Sebastian's, will lock horns on the 9th and 10th of March at the Moratua grounds. Dubbed the 68th Battle of the Goals, Savidupiris will lead the Prince of Wales side and the Sebastian Knights will be captained by Tarusha Fernando. The limited overs encounter between these two teams will be worked off on the 11th of March at the same ground. You are watching Sri Lanka's number one news channel, Other Therana 24-7. Let's now cross over to Manusha Jayatilka for your forecast first, evening edition. A very good evening and welcome to forecast first. Tomorrow is not expected to be a scorching day as temperatures are set to vary between 18 to 31 degrees Celsius over the next 24 hours. The highest temperature is expected in Putlam, while newer area will be rather chilly. Our viewers in Jaffna, Mana, Chinkumali and Kandy can expect light rain activity and the wet weather will make its way to south to Batiklu and Hamantota. That said, fair weather will prevail over rest of the districts with some areas said to be misty in the morning. Well, and that's it from First at Nine tonight. And before we go, we'd like to bring you, or more like take you, to the town of Pasir Gudang in Malaysia. The 23rd Pasir Gudang World Kite Festival is being held. Participants from over 52 countries have gathered in the town to fly their unique and colourful kites over the Malaysian sky. Representing Sri Lanka at the Kite Festival is our very own team from Loka and Lokayo of TV Derna with their homemade kite. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. Bringing you the news and information 24 hours a day. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel. Other Verona 24-7.